Hi, everybody. This is Cindy Kennedy, and you are listening to yet another episode of Living with Lyme. We are so fortunate today. We have Bridget Danner with us, and Bridget has been an acupuncturist since 2004. She's also a certified functional diagnostic nutritional practitioner. So she really has it all together. She does a lot of coaching for women. She has a great topic to talk to us uh, about today, and this is going to be a real good learning experience. Bridget, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to talk about kind of the intersection of Lyme, your expertise, and some of these other things that I study and do. Well, it, it's true because you know what? The more toxic our body is, the harder it is to recover from either Lyme or mold or Epstein Barr, anything that is in our body. So, you know, tell us a little bit about how you got involved into this whole realm of functional work and, you know, assisting people as a coach. Uh, so the first, you know, the first time I went into natural medicine school was for Chinese medicine in 2000. And that was really more um, from a drive about protecting the environment and making good choices. Uh, so I thought, well, if I'm a practitioner of natural medicine, I can also talk to people about, you know, recycling or riding their bike or whatever. So I think this is my vision a long time ago. And then when I graduated, I moved to Portland, Oregon and started practicing and everyone there is already like recycling riding their bikes so i kind of forgot about all of that and i just got got good at doing doing acupuncture and doing my thing um, but then some years later i got really sick i frankly i was sick for a long time without fully knowing what was going on but it kind of hit hit a peak okay well, let me back up so as i was getting sick which was pretty soon after my son was born um, you know, I just wasn't doing well. I wasn't recovering well. And that's sort of how I got into eating better, functional medicine, kind of just for my own self. But then I was like, well, this is pretty exciting. I want to do, do more of it. So I was starting to, you know, learning the labs, doing the things. And then I really got sick. Um, and all the things I was doing just weren't even enough. And then I found out I had mold. So then I like I wasn't even doing anything. I wasn't seeing clients anyway, um, and I was really learning about detox and mold, and you know a lot of what you do, like really deep root cause stuff, co-infections and stuff. Um, and then I moved to Phoenix. We might talk about that later. Um, I, w I didn't have my clinic anymore, so it was really kind of a, a new start, and I really wanted to bring more detox into what I was talking about. It's mostly talking about women's health, actually. Uh, so I started to bring in more of these conversations about mold and detox, and people really um, needed it. It was well received. Um, and it feels good to me, you know, as you're probably similar with a as a practitioner, you want to be doing the things you're learning, you know, you want to be growing intellectually with your practice. Um, so, so yeah, that's sort of my journey and it was a little bit full circle because I always wanted to do environmental stuff and then I really, I really am now because of my own experience with environmental illness. Yeah, you got thrown into that, didn't you? Yeah, it's funny, funny how life uh, <laughs> makes sure you do something. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Geez, couldn't somebody have just written me a note instead of got yeah. <laughs> so sick? You feeling well these days? I'm feeling pretty well. I've been having some Epstein Barr flare lately. Winter is harder for me, and then I I traveled um, a few times in January, which was too much. Um, so I'm really focused on that right now. But yeah, overall pretty well. Uh, you know, I get bummed when the Epstein Barr comes back. So I'm like, oh, here we go again. So that's just something I really want to focus on yeah. over this year. Like, how do I really get that to go to sleep? Right, right. Go to sleep. It's all about that immune system. You know, when you get bombarded, you know, the plane rides, if that's the way you were traveling, I, I'm telling you, it's, it's like a, a bug fest in, in plane. Yeah. And the time zones and it's cold and like, it just is very 
um, disrupting for me. And you add that it's winter. I mean, I live in Arizona. It's not the worst place to have a winter, but it's still enough that it's a little challenging for my body. Yeah. So let's, let's talk briefly about what you do and how people can get in touch with you. Sure. So now we mainly offer lab testing, lab reviews, and specialized supplements online, all with like very generous doses of education. So, you know, if you just want to come on and read a lot of blogs, you can. We have plenty of information. We've got videos. Um, but yeah, with clients, some people are just buying supplements that they're learning about based on their own conditions. And some people are coming in for some not coming in because it's online. Some people are choosing some lab testing, having us look over labs for them, and then we make a protocol for them. Yeah, that's, that's really, it's necessary. People don't know where to reach out. And people don't necessarily know what to expect when it comes to functional medicine. And I'm going to tell you that you do such a great job with your emails, your blogs, because people can relate to it. You know, sometimes people write and they're, they're not, um, let's say they're, they're too elaborate with their, with their explanations and, mm. all. and yours are perfect. They're well-written and they're lovely. So oh, good. Thank yeah, you. Really, yeah. Really, really love it. And I've been reminded, you know, keep bringing in my story to make it because there's, yeah, I mean, honest, like I still have flare ups. They still have to manage my health. Um, I mean, I'm overall pretty healthy, but probably like you and your clients, it's still like a management thing. <laughs> it is and, uh, a job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know what, let's, let's talk about what you do the best. Let's mm. talk about women and hormones. I practiced gynecology for 20 some odd years. Love oh. my ladies. And now I'm taking care of men. And it's it's so different. It's very different. Love my ladies. I love to relate, but you know, hormones, that was my job. You know, we, we talked about hormones and now in this space, I'm learning just how important they are, but your body has to constantly be in a balance. And so talk to me a bit about how toxins and whatnot, how do they affect our hormonal status? Yeah, I think toxins are undervalued as a disruptor of hormones. Uh, so many women are complaining about their hormones, blaming things on their hormones, right? I can't sleep because of my hormones, hot flashes because of my, I can't lose weight because of my hormones. But they don't really know what to do next besides blame them. Uh, so actually, I just made a video yesterday about foods for hormones and you know basic supplements for hormones. So that's important because we make hormones out of what we eat, so we need to eat well, digest well, um, and have good self-care. But then in the background is playing the, these toxins, and we're all exposed to them. You know, when we're, we go to the coffee shop, when we shower, you know, there's many ways to be exposed throughout the day we can talk about. Um, and, you know, just a few of the mechanisms are often inflammatory, so then your cells are kind of getting inflamed and not communicating as well with each other. If your brain is inflamed, sometimes right from the hypothalamus pituitary, your hormone production is being affected. Um, they can actually affect the mechanism of cells, not letting insulin in, you know, not letting thyroid hormone in. Um, so how can your hormones work correctly when those things are happening? So, you know, sometimes Taking out toxins can be a big needle mover for people, um, but usually it's like a whole picture thing, like what are the few buckets that we need to look at for any one individual's hormones. So, yeah, so you go for the low-hanging fruit, right? Yeah, you've got to treat, you've got to address that background stuff, and a lot of my clients already are, but there's always like questions or little places like, oh, I still really need a water filter, or... I don't know, like, you know, because what my clients are, community are usually already pretty well educated. If you go outside of that community, there's just nothing going on there, really. You know, no sense of, you know, that your coffee cup from Starbucks is disrupting your hormones. Your 
your perfume is disrupting your hormones. There just isn't any concept of that. Um, so hopefully, you know, sometimes we're pulling in people who have never been exposed to these concepts and they're getting a first idea. But um, for the rest of us, yeah, sometimes going, going a little deeper. My big thing is water bottles. I'm talking about the plastic crunch, 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 crunch yeah. water bottles. And I, you know, I look at people and I, I was having my nails done yesterday and um, she had her nice metal cup with her tea, um, but she also had a water bottle. And I'm like, Gina, why? She goes, oh, it's so convenient. I'm like, it's gonna make you sick. You can't do that. You know, get another mug, do something. You know, get a, a Brita, you know, something that you can actually use that's going to do some filtration. Yeah, I wouldn't actually get a Brita. It doesn't do much of anything, really. But get a Berkey, you know, not much more expensive, lasts a super long time. You don't have to replace the filter, but like every two years. Still might not get every single thing. You have to buy like an extra one for fluoride. But they're pretty awesome, and the water tastes really good when it comes out. But yeah, here in Arizona, a lot of people use plastic water bottles. And, you know, we should be drinking water. But when I was in Portland, nobody used plastic water bottles. Nobody. And now it's just like people buy the whole case. And they just have them in the fridge because, yeah, it's like easier than like getting a glass of water or tastes better or whatever. And uh, yeah, it's just so it's so common here. It's it's, it's kind of funny, but not really that, <laughs> that funny. It's just like a courtesy. Like here's a bottle of water, and you're like, oh, exactly, okay. exactly. And that's what you have. Like you, you know, check into your hotel room, and what's sitting on the side there? They've got you a couple of plastic water bottles because they want you to stay hydrated. Anyways, where else in our house? Let's start in our house. Where do we go to improve our elimination of toxins do we go to our cabinets do we go to our cleaners what is it that we should work on yeah i kind of say like five areas within the house your pantry your kitchen your you know cleaning closet your medicine cabinet and your bathroom a couple of the low hanging there's are plastic and fragrance just avoiding you know food touching your plastic or plastic touching your food at any stage in the process from storage to stirring. Um, and then fragrances in so many things now, um, you know, dryer sheets and air freshener and shampoo. So usually a company that is avoiding any artificial fragrance is also doing some other things right. So it's a, a good place to start. Um, so you wanna avoid the word parfum, parfum or fragrance. Um, and then beyond that, Yes, similar to in food storage, um, you know, buy, a lot of processed food is touching plastic when you buy it. So frozen pizzas are with the like the little plastic paper. A lot of things that look like paper are coated in plastic, right? So you're, that's why your Starbucks cup is a problem. It's paper coated in plastic and it has a soft plastic lid and it's exposed to heat and probably acid. So those two things are gonna help transfer the right. plastic compounds yeah. into you. Think about sipping, sipping through that top, you know? It's, it's heat and that's going to cause a release. So not only are you sipping it, you're probably breathing it. Yeah, yeah, you probably are. It's kind of like in the shower, you know, if you don't have filtered water, all the bleach and stuff is coming, steaming out around you. So you can do a whole house filter or just a shower head filter. Um, we have a whole house filter that we invested in, but it is a bit of a pain because I have to like maintain it and stuff. But if you're going to stay in one place for a long time, I think it, it, it's a good idea. And you know, your audience may be more versed. So also just thinking about your big purchases, like carpets, mattresses, curtains, um, you know, laminate floor, really off gases. So just thinking, like stopping a question like, what is this made out of? Can I get it with a natural fiber instead of a synthetic fiber? Right. And, you know, your clothing, your clothing that's touching your body. We never thought of it a long time ago. We're like, fleece, oh, that's so cool. It's made out of fish soda. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, it's so warm. It's so lovely. And who knew, you know? Yeah, I need to learn more about that. I know I read somewhere that like, you know, cotton is a very dirty crop and that supposedly some of that can like transfer on you. I kind of, I just need to read more to understand that better um, but you can buy organic linens pretty easily and towels um, that's a pretty easy thing to find and sometimes just buying used things um, is better than buying brand new things because it's already been washed a bunch of times oh that's a good point where do we store these toxins in our body and why isn't it just that we take it in and we eliminate it yeah, so they really can be anywhere. I mean, it's pretty well known that it's in fat tissue as a storage place, but it's also stored in bone and just any any cell can be affected by toxins. Um, so we do, you know, we do detox naturally. Our body is trying to detox all the time, but if we haven't had the right nutrition, if we have an exposure that's too overwhelming, if we have different genetic conditions and co-infections and all this stuff, it can just be too much and the body cannot keep up with the toxic load. So you just have to kind of constantly, I, in my opinion, just support that aspect of, of detoxification. Um, just knowing you're always being exposed and just kind of always gently supporting that and there's times where you're hopefully going to go harder you know if you travel you're probably eating worse eating out like you said being exposed to more things so when you get home clean up your act for a few days you doing your juicing doing your dry brushing going to the sauna and yeah just kind of detox harder for a bit the sauna is big the sauna yeah. is big yeah in in my uh my new center we do have a the three in one farm for red sauna. I, nice. you, yeah, because I know that you're very, very pro sauna. I'm very pro sauna. Everybody who's always, you know, is dealing with mold or, you know, toxin detox with us, I'm like, you have to use the sauna. Three right. times a week is kind of my minimum for people who are going through it. Right, right. And it's the whole process. I mean, we detoxify through sweat. And people, um, it's a good thing to sweat, but it's interesting. I've uh, dealt with some patients that I don't know exactly the mechanism, but they really don't sweat. And that's hard to promote that. Uh, you can only heat somebody's body so much. And if they're not perspiring, I think it- So you, you still do detox though, even though if you won't sweat in a sauna. So you will still detox out of your urine and your stool. So uh, they, you no, might want to, no. yeah, so I learned that from like a sauna rep who was really like, you don't have to sweat. You can just kind of sit in there and hang out and read a book. They sell a sauna that's sort of like a half body sauna that you can sit in. And they're like, it's, they, he said, now I don't know where he got all this information, but it, it does hold true because you don't just sweat it out, right? Like the way we test for toxins is through urine. So you're obviously peeing them out too. So he was like, you know, just sit in there and it's still heating up your body and, and you're still detoxing internally. He, he's like, you don't really have to get all sweaty every time. Right, right. Do you promote exercise in general for helping your body detox? I mean, kind of yes and no. Like movement moves lymph, moves toxins, like using a rebounder is like a good exercise for detox. Um, any exercise is good, but too much exercise actually can create oxidation in the body. So it's not like you have to be training for a marathon to detox. Because Sometimes you're also putting your body in somewhat of a state of stress. So you don't really detox when you're like stress sweating, so to speak. Um, so it's like a balance. Right. People think I'm going to go to the gym and I'm beat myself up, but you're causing breakdown of your muscle it's releasing lactic acid and that's why it's just important to really think about that and yes i usually ask people about their movement and then they look at me with that face mm -hmm. you talking about the bathroom no i'm <laughs> talking about your body how do you move your body and uh it, it makes it less um 
kind of intrusive to them. They're not like, oh, I don't do anything or I don't go to the gym or whatever. But it it is about generally moving, you know, just yeah. Doing, yeah, you can do yoga, you can go to a dance class. If you're really fatigued, you know, you might be doing less, but you still should be doing it. And I would say don't just walk. Some people just get like, well, I walk and that's nice. Walking is great but it shouldn't be the only type of movement that you get. It's uh, you need variety in your body. So yeah, but I, I am definitely a fan of, of movement for sure. So, you know, one of the questions is, and we talked about it before we were um, recording here, toxins can cause some weight issues. And do you find that it's more common with women because generally we have more, um, I, I, well, let's put it to you this way. We have less lean muscle mass than men. So mm. my question is, because we do absorb and we hold it, we can hold it into our, into our fat, uh, are we holding more and causing this uh, a problem? Because there is some uh, resistance in our body to lose that weight, that mm. we feel, especially around our midsection, right? Yeah, you know, I haven't yeah, seen a study too. on that. <laughs> <You're too young. laughs> I haven't seen a study on that, but I, it makes sense. I also see mostly women because I have a long history of that. So I, I don't have a lot of like examples to compare in my own practice. I think it could happen to men or women. We do see men with, you know, man boobs now. That's sort of a modern phenomenon. And a lot of that is, is having to do with hormone disruption from toxicity. Um, so I do think we see that out in the general population a lot, men and women. Um, in my practice, I see more women, and these are women who are often really trying to eat right, maybe even fasting, and there's still something going on. It's sort of an item of investigation for me right now. It's like, why are all these women still having some blood sugar issues? So it could be toxicity for sure. Or maybe there's something else going on that I want to investigate because, yeah, I've got people don't usually come to me as with weight as a main complaint, but they're often like, well, I can't lose these 15 pounds or whatever, even though I'm doing all these things right. So, yes, I'm often like detox, A, eh? <laughs> and then what else is going on? You know, it's interesting because of my career in gynecology, I've seen uh, the changes, even in my own children, uh, earlier, they, I mean, they were still on target, but still earlier breast development, earlier maturation. And this was, you know, back when they were children, there wasn't this big push for organic, you know, we, that probably were on the cusp of learning more about that. But you think about the animals and the hormones and the antibiotics that these animals are given and kids back then they're drinking gallons of milk. And you just have to wonder if that's just enough that push these kids, these ladies over the edge and it started their development process earlier than naturally should. Oh yeah, I definitely think that's happening for sure. Um, and, and unfortunately, like this epigenetic insulin resistance that could be caused from toxicity can be passed down to your child. Um, so people are, kids are being born like with a disadvantage for, in, with insulin resistance nowadays. And yes, they, all the toxins can very much be contributing to the hormones and you know, early growth, which I think is all can also make you more prone to hormonal cancers when you, um, you know, have an early puberty. So there's a lot of factors. Yeah. And it's a touchy subject because you don't want to blame a mom for like, oh, you did the wrong things when you, I mean, what can she do now? It's, it is what it is. Right. Water um, to the bridge. <laughs> yeah. But if you're looking to get pregnant and hearing this, you know, there is a lot you can do to improve your baby's chances by detoxing and changing some of these things before your baby's born you know we see everybody getting ready for the baby right all the things and i would so much love to see so much environmental awareness during that time what kind of crib are you putting your baby in what toxins do you have around your house you know you can really start this kid off on the right foot if you are conscious 
of what you're exposing them to in the womb and in their early years because where they're most susceptible right they're drinking your breast milk things are coming through through that um, they're putting everything in their mouths as we know <laughs> so it's an important time to be aware of you know I learned something really interesting um, if you ask someone how did you feel during pregnancy and the answer from this person is I've never felt better that's a sign that they were a bit toxic and they were using the filtration through the baby because that's yet another way to filter. Oh my gosh. And I was like, oh my God, what did I do to my kids? I never felt better. And I just assumed it was, you know, my hormones were more stable. I wasn't having ups and downs and who knows what it was, you know, who knows? Never, never. And you try to talk to a regular obstetrician about that. They're just, they're not going to, they're not going to take that. They're, they're going to say. I'd be curious to look that up too. You know, is, is anybody studied that? Um, I felt awful. <laughs> but I, I think for other reasons, you know, it's a lot of hormones course coursing through your liver. And if you can't handle it all, you're going to be nauseous and stuff. So. Right. And when that, I look back, I'm like, ooh, I wasn't really as healthy as I should have been. <laughs> I know. You got to get, you're green for at least, you know, 13 weeks. You're just green. And, ugh, you know, yeah. as old as I am, with my kids being just uh, almost 30 and two in the 30s, I still can grapple with the fact that that nausea was, it was, it was awful. It was it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. You'll never forget it. It is horrible. It is horrible. And then back, you know, uh, some of the, the thought was that if you ovulate from your right ovary, um, you know, you have that circula circulation close to the liver and you're dumping hormones into the liver and that might be what's triggering more nausea. I don't even know. I mean, I, I don't think most people can even tell what side they've ovulated on, but it's, it is, it's not a pretty picture, you know, it's very difficult. And then you think of these poor women for three months, all they can eat or tolerate are like bagels. And you're like, oh my God, you know, white bagels, what are they doing? You know, barely. Yeah. Can and it's a tough time. Yeah. 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 I, I worked a lot with fertility and pregnancy earlier in my career. And yeah, there's great preparation you can do, but sometimes, you know, like there's no time for that or whatever. It just sort of happens and you don't always know what it's going to be like if you've never been through it. So, you know, you just kind of have to roll with it. Once it I, know, I know. So first let's, let's talk about what type of testing is recommended to determine how toxic the body is. Yeah. So I guess there's, three types of tests that come to mind two we offer and one we do not currently um, you know we do mold testing um, through urine so if you do suspect mold i think that's an important one to do uh, and as an add-on to that test or it could potentially be separate but we usually do it all together is actual toxin testing so it's chemical testing so it's testing for things like pesticides styrenes um, gasoline additives, jet fuel additives, you wouldn't believe what's in us. Uh, so it can be interesting to see and just get a sense of where you're at. Some of these tests that we offer also include some markers of mitochondrial damage and glutathione status, CoQ10 status. So you can not only see the toxins, but like how it's potentially depleted you. Um, so I think that's a good test. I say, A, just for curiosity, you know, it's interesting to see chronic fatigue, infertility, kids with autism, ADHD, people with cancer, um, people just with like kind of mystery illness that they haven't been able to figure out, multiple chemical sensitivity, certainly. Um, so it's a, it's a really interesting test and it's at home. Um, and then heavy metal testing, you know, it can be a little tricky to read and, and get it. Sometimes you have to spend some time pushing out toxins, um, but you can do that with like hair, urine, blood. We mostly send people for the hair test. 
Um, and that's maybe something we'll add to our practice later. And then there's certainly other toxins that we make within us, like with Lyme, or um, we test the stool quite a bit, so we look for gut infections, that kind of a thing. Um, yeah, mostly people kind of know what they want and what they're curious about, and they can pick on their own. But sometimes we also help people kind of decide where to start or what test would be best next for them. Right, right. You know, what is the clinical presentation so that you can decide, you know, because sometimes it's, you know, the money factor is big when it comes to these type of tests and people yeah. are, a lot of people are discouraged to find out that the insurance companies are either not going to pay at all or pay a very small portion. And it does leave a little hole in the bank account. Yeah. Yeah. And occasionally people will pick a test and it won't really be like the star of the show. And then I'm like, oh, I really wish you'd pick this test or I don't recommend you do this test next. Like hormones is a good example. We, our hormone panel is probably the most popular test and it's very interesting, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't sometimes tell you enough like root cause information, you know? So I really like to also see, you know, the gut or see for toxins, that kind of a thing. So, um, but all the test results are interesting, certainly, but right. And yeah, it's, a, it's amazing because, and I know exactly what test you're talking about when it comes to the environmental uh, toxins. And it's amazing what people will come back with, you know, like you said, styrene, and you, we're talking about all kinds of that, the plastics and the styrofoam and whatnot that we're exposed to. And people think, well, I don't eat styrofoam. I'm like, well, it's not just eating. It's any part of that breakdown. You could probably be absorbing some of that. Um, but you know, the whole contamination of plastics, we're, we're, it's just our environment is just spilled and our yeah. ability not to be able to slow down. Everything has to be fast. And I, I cringe now if I see someone uh, putting something plastic in the microwave. Uh, that oh, I know. <laughs> I know. I went to this little Mexican place and I was all excited about it. And I ordered enchiladas and they put it on a plate and then they put it in the microwave, like a plastic plate. And my jaw just like, it was like dropped. You, the question is, did you eat it or just send it back? Uh, you know, it, it's funny because I, I was with my partner and he, he knew I would, you know, he, I was just like a deer in headlights and he's like, could you just, just not, you know, he had him take it out like early, you know, he's like, could you just, yeah. And I still ate it, you know, sometimes you just have to like go yeah. with the flow. Um, right. and here in Phoenix, same thing. I mean, there's a lot of, in Portland, you could not serve styrofoam. I don't think it was like banned. Um, but the, here there's, you know, n no consciousness about uh, what we eat our food on. And really any plate, almost any plate is dangerous because even if it looks paper, it's coated. Um, so eating out is like a, a big story. <laughs> So, so many toxins oh, and <laughs> pesticides. I mean, they're buying the cheapest stuff they can because they have to watch their margins and that's just sort of how it is. So, you know, just better to eat at home most of the time. But, you know, life happens. You can't be too paranoid. And I will tell you, I have clients who are super paranoid and careful and still their levels are high. And then I have people who just seem to be great detoxifiers. And I can think of one lady in particular. I'm like, I have like literally never seen anyone this low. And she wasn't doing anything special. So it's, you know, it's, it's out there and it's in you. And even if you're mostly eating organic and stuff, you'd be surprised how high the levels are on people. It's, it's, it's a really sad. And the air, you know, the gasoline additives, the jet fuel, like, we are sucking that in and we don't think about it at all. I don't when I'm outside. <laughs> oh, I know. I forget who it was said uh, when they pump gas, they look to feel which way the air is, you know, blowing and make sure that they're at a pump that it's, you know, going that away, not at them. You know, that's a lot of consciousness, I have to say. Yeah. But imagine these people who are out on the runway with their little sticks, you know, with all the jet fuel. Why is it, why, you know, I say these things, why are these people 
not totally disabled. What's with that? And then I always ask about the landscapers. Landscapers are in the thick of the stuff. They're in the bushes, in the trees, they're tall grass. Why are they not all just dropping from Lyme disease? I, I, I know no one has enough money to study these things, uh, and especially because it's not cured by a pharmaceutical jab, jab, jab. <laughs> but uh, why is that? You know, what, right. what makes these people, you know, not- Some of them seem resilient. Yeah, I think sometimes it catches up to you later or it depends on your, your, your genetics and that kind of a thing. I mean, the big roundup case was a, a, like a landscaper, long maintenance guy for a school district in California. Um, so, and I, there are some documented studies about the airline industry and infertility and cancers because flying is dangerous too with all the radiation and stuff. So um, yeah, as far as professions go, airline industry is, I think, a tough one. And you're right. Why don't you see it all the time? Because there's just so many factors combined. Um, you know, and I still fly places. Like, I need those people too, you know. But I think it's something to be aware of at the minimum. You know, how, how much are we flying? I think is a great thing to, you know, ask ourselves. You know, do we really need to do it so much? And if you are in that industry, what can you do to just mitigate the damage? Like lots of antioxidants, I think, are really important if you're in that industry. Give us a, an idea. People hear the word antioxidant. What, what nutritional ways can we get antioxidants? What, you know, we know that glutathione is our major antioxidant and vitamin C. What else can people think about in terms of their food that can help them either produce or bring in antioxidants. Yeah, eating the rainbow is a really great concept. I love because, the rainbow. Yeah, I love so many different plant, you know, polyphenols with different, you know, purple, red, yellow, um, you know, onions and garlic are great for the liver. So there are a ton of foods high in antioxidants. Green tea is, is good. Um, uh, yeah, berries we all kind of know about, and nuts are really high in a lot of different Ooh, beneficial. I love nuts, love nuts. Yeah, they they always pop up for all the micronutrients they have and stuff. Um, turmeric, ginger, you know, cooking with spices. Um, as far as supplements, uh, you can do like um, also turmeric, you can do EGCG is like the green tea compound. I like that one. You can do vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C. You know, sometimes some practitioners will high dose A or C like while you're working with detox. So um, some of it's simple, just getting like a really high quality multivitamin, eating a lot of different whole foods. Um, and then there's more specialized things you can get into as well right 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 we uh we talked about um we talked about coffee enemas but we're not really going to talk about that right now but i just want to throw that out there but what about castor oil packs How yeah are they are helpful um they, they sort of topically can kind of pull out toxins and circulate the liver or the intestine. So they can be really great for weight loss. That's a kind of interesting combo of detox and weight loss. Um, I've been looking into some that are kind of like overnight packs that you can do that I'd like to maybe offer in our shop. Yeah, that can be a really easy way, you know, just as you go to bed at night, you either do a pack and take it off or you leave it on. Um, and you can put essential oils in there, which are also sort of an, yeah, like antioxidant to rosemary is one that comes to mind or the citruses. So you can potentially do it right on there. Um, can be really great for breast health too. I've been doing castor oil on, um, on my breasts because I had some like dense breasts and I was like, let me just see if this can help kind of soften some of that. So um, yeah, you can do it on sore joints, lots of things. But probably most popular would be liver and in, or intestines for weight loss or general detox. Right. Who knew? Right. Who knew? Castor oil. You think <laughs> something that your grandmother made you take? You had to hold your nose and and get a teaspoon of that down. <laughs> yeah. 
that's yeah. tough. That's tough. So, you know, if you, if you have to say, okay, I'm going to talk about healthy living and I'm going to give four pointers. Let's try four pillars. And that's, I'm, I'm throwing this at you without ever talking about it. So, <laughs> so four pillars, give me the four pillars of being well, staying well, or even recovering. It's funny you say four pillars because I have four pillars of detox. I didn't know if you know that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's I remember like a that. connection. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. So let's see if I remember them all. So one is support, support the body systems with like good nutrition, support your liver, you know, know, know how your body works and supports the different system. Keep your bowels moving, stuff like that. Um, another is bind, using binders to move toxins out. We didn't talk about those much, but things like charcoal and clay just kind of hold on to those toxins as they move through the bowels. Um, another is mobilize, so things like exercise that we talked about and also dry brushing and sauna, get toxins moving. Um, now what's my other one called? It might be just be called like remove or something like just supplements that um kind of actually get detox happening like mm, glutathione you mentioned or chlorella that, those kind of things so um there's you know you're doing some things to actively detox mobilize things bind them on the way out and then just support the whole body because it's probably been, you know, you need to support those body systems for effective detox, and they've probably been somewhat depleted or damaged from whatever situation you've gotten yourself into. <laughs> what have you gotten yourself into? What have you gotten yourself into <laughs> now? You know, the, the thing with chlorella, um, it's a great, it's very helpful with, um, with metals, but I understand that if you have a handful of uh, cilantro and you also use the chlorella you're more apt to be able to bind and eliminate metals yeah cilantro is supposed to be good for heavy metals i actually someone just said well what are your studies on that and i couldn't find really much yeah. but a lot of my detox friends use cilantro in lots of different ways uh, so i don't know like where the studies are but yeah, cilantro is definitely known as a heavy metal detoxifier. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, a cool thing. You know, talk about just a, a little bit about how, you know, binders are there to take up toxins. So when we're dealing with mold issues, mold likes to hide all over the body. But as it's changing and replicating, it's producing these toxins. So how do you get the mold from wherever it is out and into the gut to get rid of it? Yeah, so that's sort of the stuff we talked about with sauna is mobilizing, exercise is mobilizing, dry brush is mobilizing, um, and then some things sort of enhance natural detoxification like glutathione, supplementation, doing those antioxidants. So. Yeah, and some of the tissues you may want to get more specific and do like ozone therapy or do nasal washes and sprays. There are probably some tissues that could be deep in you that have mold and that they're hard to get to. I don't think we've come along enough in the study of mold to really know what to say there exactly. Um, you can do like nebulizers for your lungs. There's different ways to do it. Um, but again, if you're, if you're mobilizing, if you're supporting, if you're doing active detox things, you're sort of shaking the whole snow globe and things should be coming out. Um, and you can certainly, if you have the budget, you know, be checking that with testing. But I, I went to a class this fall from the lab company we use, and they see a lot of before and after tests. And even just using a sauna every day for three months is usually like enough to like really knock things down. So um, they, you know, I don't have, I don't see as many before and after tests, but they do. And, um, you know, that's sort of the good news is, you know, you can, you can get rid of these things. 
Yeah, it is. It is good. It is good. And it doesn't have to be, you know, when you look things up and you go to Dr. Google and they'll give you, you know, 10 things to do. It's not necessary to do all 10, at least not all at the same time. You can rotate through some of those things yeah. that are easy yeah. for you to do without breaking the bank. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And that's why I really promote this like, kind of DIY detox concept because, you know, going out for IV therapy, cryotherapy, all these things, you know, they're expensive. Not to say they don't have value, but it's, you really need to just be doing the things right in your own home um, and know that they have an impact. Right. It's, it's like being part of what you normally do. And it's just part, it's, you know, unfortunate, our day, date, and time here, we are now products of our environment. And we just really have to realize that for health's sake, for longevity, and, you know, people do want to live a little, a little later in life than maybe their grandparents did, but we all want to live it healthy. We don't want to live it to the point where we're sick, because that if you don't have quality in your life, why, you know, why do we want to be hanging around? Exactly. Yeah, I like that. I like that concept. So is there anything else we missed that you feel like, gosh, I forgot to talk about, she did ask me about? You know, I would just say, I know there's probably some specifics that people may be like, well, I wanted to hear more about this or that. And you can just go to our blog and like use the search bar if you want to Look about weight or mold. We have a lot of resources on mold. It's such a giant topic. I know people want to know about their house and all that stuff. So we have testing for your house options. So um, if there's something that got stirred up here that you're like, I need more, um, just, yeah, you're, or my site is just BridgetDanner.com and you can just, yeah, go to the blog, search it. Um, if you're having trouble with your search, you can email us, but you'll likely find some things to kind of just keep learning. Yeah. And that's, that's really the most important part is don't take no for an answer. Keep moving forward. If you're not being listened to and you know something is underlyingly wrong, you need to find that next person to help you out. Yes. I appreciate it. Thank you for visiting. Thanks, Cindy. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm Mrs. Rogers. I've kind of got this little... <laughs> You do have a nice cardigan on. Cardigan on. It's freezing. I'm in Massachusetts. It's freezing up here. It's awful. We had an ice storm last night. It's terrible. Uh, but, but anyways, thank you so much. Hang on the line there. Just want to say bye to all my listeners. For everybody that is listening, this has been another episode of Living with Lyme. Come back. Subscribe to the website, www.livingwithlyme.us. Come back, listen to us some more. We've got some great guests coming up, and I'm very, very, very pleased and humbled by all you listeners. So take good care. Be well. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.